good afternoon and uh, it's the 11th webinar which we are, we are organizing today and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce dr johanna meyer who is a bateson research fellow at the university of cambridge she had her phd in ecology and evolution from university of bern switzerland her research focuses on speciation and evolutionary genomics she is trying to answer the questions like why do some taxa rapidly generate new species whereas others remain species poor she is particularly interested in the role of hybridization interbreeding in rapid speciation and adaptation Her study systems include heliconius butterflies from Andes in Ecuador and cichlid fishes from East African Lake Victoria. Her research work has appeared in journals like Nature, Evolution, Molecular Ecology, Proceedings of Royal Society B, Biological Sciences, to mention a few. And out of this tremendous stuff, one of my favorite is a commentarial view on speciation and adaptive adaptive radiation. that was recently published in trends in ecology and evolution so please join me in welcoming johanna for today's talk many thanks for the kind invitation it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce my research to you um i will start screen sharing now yeah, i hope yes, you can yeah. see it. Okay. Great. My talk is going to be about the role of hybridization in facilitating adaptive radiation in mostly cichlid fishes, which are these colorful ones here, and heliconius butterflies, which are these ones here. The work on cichlid fishes um, was mostly in col collaboration with Ole Seehausen, who is a professor at University of Bern and Erwach in Switzerland. And the work on heliconius butterflies is a collaboration with Professor Chris Jiggins, who is at University of Cambridge. So let's first start um, with what is an adaptive radiation. It is when a species rapidly speciates into multiple species using different ecological niches. The most famous example are the Darwin's finches on Galapagos Islands, where one Galapagos ancestor finch. um colonized the islands and then split into many different finch species that utilize different um seeds as food resources and have adapted via different beak sizes and shapes so for an adaptive radiation to occur it requires ecological opportunity like the different seeds that these finches were feeding on that were there and no other species were using them It also requires some reproductive isolation to make sure that the species are able to um, adapt to different ecological resources and don't completely mix all the time and lose their um, respective local adaptation again. Um, I'm not going to talk about Darwin's finches, but about cichlid fishes mostly, and these are these um, beautifully diverse um, group of cichlid fish. that have diversified in Lake Victoria in East Africa here in Lake Tanganyika and in Lake Malawi these adaptive radiations are iconic examples of adaptive radiation but actually when cichlids colonize a lake they don't always form adaptive radiations sometimes they don't speciate at all and sometimes they speciate into in this um, amazing diversity Katie Wagner who is now an assistant professor at U University of Wyoming she tried to figure out what's what makes what's so different between those cases where the cichlids have colonized a lake and have radiated versus those cases where they have colonized lakes or rivers and have not radiated so she compared 38 radiations with 145 colonizations where no radiation happened and what she found is that the predictive factors are mostly depth and energy so the deeper lakes <laughs> and the closer to the equator the lakes are the more likely it is that an adaptive radiation happens and that's part of ecological opportunity so that makes sense the more ecological opportunity you have <clears throat> the more likely it is that an adaptive radiation happens 
Then she also found another very important factor, which is sexual dichromatism. And that plays into sexual selection, which contributes to reproductive isolation. These cichlid fish, they have different color, the males mostly. And different species prefer males of different coloration, and that allows them to coexist without completely merging back into one species. So many different species can coexist at the same place because they will only choose mates of their own species based on coloration. And so again, reproductive isolation and ecological opportunity is what seems to be important. However, there are cases that her model cannot explain. Like for instance, Lake Victoria was colonized by these five lineages of cichlids and these four did not generate any new species, whereas this one generated 500 species and made this beautiful adaptive radiation that we know now from Lake Victoria. And we know that they colonized the lake at the same time. This is work by Moritz Muschik and Ole Seehasen, where they looked at sediment cores and they found that there's teeth of the radiating lineage right after the formation of the lake and also teeth of the non-radiating lineages. So there is no priority effect. It's not that this one just colonized the lake first and had all the ecological opportunity and these other guys then came later and therefore had no eco ecological opportunity left because all niches were already filled by this lineage. That's not the case. So during my PhD and those also still now, I was investigating what makes this one lineage of cichlids so radiation prone. So let me first introduce this lineage. It generated about 700 species in only 150,000 years. You can see um, that they are very diverse and in each of the lakes in the region, so if we zoom in here, there's Lake Victoria, Albert, Edward, Kivu, Kagera, Saka and Kyoka, and in each of those lakes, this lineage <coughs> has formed an adaptive radiation. Um, the largest is in Lake Victoria, but also the other lakes harbor adaptive radiations of this same lineage. And all together, they make up about 700 species. <coughs> and in each lake, this lineage formed entire trophic food webs. So there are species that feed on other cichlid fish, there are species that feed on algae, species that feed on, on snails, etc. <coughs> Basically, every ecological niche you can imagine, they have built it. So to figure out where these cichlids came from and what's their ancestry, first we collab uh, got samples from collaborators and also samples on our, <clears throat> on our own to get cichlid fishes from all regions um, of drainage systems that are connected to this Lake Victoria region. And then I formed a phylogenetic tree showing the ancestry relationships between the species. But because this is a gigantic tree and you cannot read anything, I'm going to zoom into this region and blow it up. So we have the Lake Victoria region super flock that's like the combination of these different flocks of these diff different adaptive radiations in the different lakes of the Lake Victoria region. So Lake Albert, Edward, Kiwi, Saka, Victoria and Kagera. They all form a monophyletic group in the phylogenetic tree. And the closest relatives are from the Congo, two species that are, occur in the Congo River. And the next closest relatives are cichlids that occur in the upper Nile region um, and cichlids that occur in, on the east of the Lake Victoria region. Um, and so I thought, well, in that case, they come from the Congo. Congolese cichlids have colonized the Lake Victoria region and have then diversified. However, then I tested if this phylogenetic tree is really a good representation of the ancestry. And I did that by comparing if these cichlid lineages um, are equally close to the Congolese cichlids or to the Lake Victoria region superflock. Given that these are a sister group to all of these, all of these should be equally close to all of these. 
So when I performed some tests, I found that these upper Nile lineage cichlids are much more closely related to the Lake Victoria region superflock than they are to the Congolese cichlids. So I, I then um, reconstructed a scenario of their origin and I found out with lots of different tests of hybridization that the Lake Victoria region superflock, so this lineage that I diversified into 700 species is of hybrid origin between the Congolese ancestor and about 20% of their genetic variation came from the upper Nile lineage. So it seems that these two lineages, the upper Nile lineage and the Congolese lineage, they came together, combined their genetic variation and of this hybrid origin, all these 700 species of the Lake Victoria region superflock emerged. However, I don't know, I didn't know at that point if this hybridization event had any effect, if that was actually facilitating the adaptive radiation. So if it did facilitate the adaptive radiation, we could imagine that if we have here, like kind of this represents the genome of the Congolese ancestor in red and in blue for the Nalotic ancestor, if these two hybridized, the genomes of the resulting hybrids would consist of different um, mos mosaics of the Congolese and the Nilotic ancestor. And then maybe new species evolved by sorting of this ancestral variation in different combinations. So that at different regions of the genome, some species would be of Congolese ancestor and others would be of Upper Nile ancestor. And then different combinations of this ancestral variation may have led to different species. And that's exactly what I found. So here I'm highlighting in red, if at the specific position in the genome, the cichlids are fixed for the Congolese allele and in blue, if they're fixed for the upper Nile allele. I looked at six species of Lake Victoria cichlids that co-occur at the same place. And then I looked at positions in the genome that are under divergent selection. So that may have contributed to the speciation of these six species. And I found that at these different sites in the genome, some species have fixed the upper Nile allele and others have fixed the Congolese allele. However, for most of these positions, I don't know what the role is of these um, sites that I looked at. For one um, position I know though, and that's the long wave sensitive opsin gene. This is a gene that allows them to see better in deep water or in shallow water. In Lake Victoria, the water is very turbid and the deeper you go, the more the particulate matter filters out all light except for red. So the deep water fish, they have adapted to this light environment by seeing red really well. And for that, they have um, selected an, uh, an upper Nile variation of the long wave sensitive opsin gene, which allows them to see red very well. Whereas the shallow water algae wars, for instance, they all have um, selected the Congolese variation of that gene, which allows them to see better in the shallow water. So bringing together the gene variants of the Congolese and the Upper Nile lineage allowed them to adapt to shallow water and to um, turbid deep water. And therefore here I can really show that the genetic variation of these two divergent lineages contributed to speciation because it allowed them to adapt to shallow and deep water and to speciate into shallow water and deep water species. So to get back to our question, what makes this one lineage of cichlids so radiation prone? I showed that it evolved from hybrid ancestry and thus started with very high genetic variation that could be selected into different species. So each species is a different mosaic of Congolese and Upper Nile alleles. This hybridization event was about 150,000 years ago and facilitated the origin of the entire Lake Victoria region superflock. So all the cichlid radiations in this region, they're all showing the same 
hybrid origin of the Upper Nile and the Congolese lineage. And they used to be more connected, but now they are isolated lakes. So it probably used to be one big radiation. However, afterwards something happened. 19 to 15,000 years ago, Lake Victoria was completely dry. And now we have this amazing diversity of 500 cichlid species in it. So what happened in between? Did the 500 species really evolve in just 15,000 years since the lake refilled? Or did maybe different cichlids from the other lakes colonize Lake Victoria and the 500 species didn't all evolve in Lake Victoria, but they are derived from different other cichlids from the other lakes? To figure this out, we have recently performed whole genome resequencing of over 450 genomes. Here you can see the number of genomes we have from the different lakes, mostly focusing on Lake Victoria. But then we also sequenced cichlids of the different ecological groups from, from, for instance, from Lake Edward and Kivu, which are deep rift lakes, which likely um, still had some water during this dry period. And therefore maybe um, Lake Victoria was colonized from Lake Edward or Kivu after this period of desiccation and then refilling. Or maybe it was colonized from the Kagera lakes, which are at higher altitude in humid climate, and therefore maybe there was still some swamps at least left that could have harbored cichlids. So first, let's have a look at the Lake Victoria cichlids. How are they um, related to each other? Here I'm showing a PCA, a principal components analysis of 293 whole genomes. And if you see different um, symbols, that, uh, symbols that are close together, that means that they are genetically similar. Whereas if they're far apart, that means that they're genetically very different. And I'm showing here with different symbols and colors, the different ecological groups. Like for instance, um, here you can see that the predators, those cichlids that feed on other fish, they all cluster together genetically, which shows that they are genetically similar and probably of, of shared ancestry so that predators may have evolved once and then diversified into different species of predators. So here mostly the different dots are different species, but some of the species I have multiple individuals of. And here's a little cluster of detritivores and here's a cluster of egg and fry eaters. So what this shows is that the species mostly group together by ecology, which means that the ecological groups may have evolved um, only once in these cases. So it is possible that, for instance, the predators, which occur in all the different lakes, that they just colonized Lake Victoria and then formed a little radiation of predators in Lake Victoria but that the predators didn't actually evolve from the same ancestral lineage than those cichlids that feed on algae or on snails in Lake Victoria, but that the predators colonized Lake Victoria and then another lineage of algae wars, so algae feeders um, colonized Lake Victoria, another lineage of snail eaters colonized Lake Victoria, etc. To figure this out, I had to make another PCA with adding in now those other cichlid uh, radiations from the other lakes. And what I find is that all Lake Victoria um, cichlids cluster together very closely, indicating that they're very, very closely related. And they also cluster together with the cichlids from Lake Yoka, which is this lake here, which is basically an extension of Lake Victoria, which also is very shallow and clearly also desiccated during the dry period. And then the, the next closest cichlids are from the Kagera lakes and clearly different are all the cichlids from the Western lakes here. And also for instance, our predators from Lake Victoria, they go together with algae scrapers from Lake Victoria with snail eaters from Lake Victoria, etc., And they do not go together with predators from Lake Edward, Kivu or Albert. So this indicates that 
the Lake Victoria and Kyoga cichlids seem to really have evolved from the same ancestry. And these different trophic groups like predators and algae scrapers, etc., really did evolve within the lake. So to answer our question, if the 500 species really evolved in only just 15,000 years since refilling of the lake, yes, all Lake Victoria species are endemic to the lake, so none of the species are shared. And also the Lake Victoria cichlids are all each other's closest relatives, indicating that they share one single genetic ancestry. But is that really true? Did they really all evolve from a single colonizing lineage? Or was there maybe again multiple colonizing lineages that hybridized? For that, I um, reconstructed the mitochondrial tree. And what you can see here is in orange, the Lake Victoria and Kyoga cichlids, in red, the Kagera Lake cichlids, and in blue, the cichlids from the Western Lake. So the Kagera Lake cichlids were those that were closest in the PCA before. And also in the mitochondrial tree, you can see now there's a haplotype group of Lake Victoria cichlids that's very similar to the Kagera Lake cichlids. And the Western Lake cichlids, just like in the PCA, are very different from all of these. However, what's interesting here is that there's a second group, a second lineage of um, a mitochondrial lineage of Lake Victoria cichlids that's deeply divergent from all the others. And this is indicative of two colonizing lineages that colonized Lake Victoria. However, when we look at the cichlids that carry this deeply divergent mitochondrial lineage in the mitochondrial phylogeny, if we look at them in the nuclear genome, so this is now from the chromosomes phylogeny, we find that, that these cichlids with the deeply divergent mitochondrial lineage are just right within the Lake Victoria radiation. So in their nuclear genome, they're not different at all from all the other cichlids, indicating that it wasn't just two lineages that colonized and stayed apart, but it was two lineages that colonized and then they hybridized. And that's why in the nuclear genome, um, they're completely mixed again. Um, to further assess if there was any hybridization, I compared Lake Victoria cichlids with cichlids that are in the rivers and in the swamps around, around Lake Victoria, Stata tilapia nubila. And to test for additional colonization events, I used this so-called D statistic or also called Ababa test, where one assumes that if these swamp or riverine um, cichlids are closely related to the Lake Victoria cichlids, which we have seen before in the tree. If there was no hybridization whatsoever, no additional colonizing lineages from Lake Edward, Kivu, Albert, and Saka into Lake Victoria, then you would expect that these cichlids and the Lake Victoria cichlids are equally close to Edward, Kivu, Albert, and Saka cichlids. So sometimes, we will find some sites in the genome where the Lake Victoria cichlids are more similar to some of these. But at other sites, you would expect that the riverine or swamp cichlids are more similar to these. And these two um, patterns should be equally common. Just because of incomplete lineage sorting, you expect that sometimes at some sites, um, Lake Victoria cichlids are more similar than to these ones, and at other sites, the riverine cichlids are more similar to these ones. However, if there was hybridization, um, an another colonizing event of, let's say, Edward cichlids into Lake Victoria cichlids, and then hybridization with these, but not with these ones, we would expect that this pattern is much more common. And that would lead to a positive D statistic. And this is exactly what I find. I find for all Western Lake cichlids, that they share more alleles with the Lake Victoria cichlids than they share with the riverine cichlids. However, all of them show basically the same pattern and they're also all close related to each other. So I cannot really tell which one it was, but I know that there was some additional gene flow from the Western Lake cichlids. 
So to get back to our question, are really all Lake Victoria cichlids derived from a single colonizing lineage? No, we see in the mitochondrial genome tree that it was at least two lineages. And also the D-statistics suggests additional lineages. So it was probably multiple lineages that colonized Lake Victoria, combined their genetic variation through hybridization. And then the Lake Victoria cichlids evolved from this hybrid origin. So we had 150,000 years ago, hybrid origin of the entire super flock, so all the radiations together that were of hybrid origin between Upper Nile and Congolese lineage. And now 15,000 years ago, since refilling of Lake Victoria, we have another hybrid origin um, of the Lake Victoria radiation from multiple lineages. But here, unfortunately, I don't know exactly which lineages it was. One may have been from the Kagera Lakes, but it's a bit harder to figure out which lineages colonized Lake Victoria at the origin. But what we can ask is, did the genetic variation of these lineages that colonized Lake Victoria contribute to the formation of different ecological groups in Lake Victoria? And to do that, um, I was looking at similar patterns that I showed before with the D-statistic. So in most regions of the genome, we would expect cichlids that feed on snails and cichlids that feed on fish from Lake Victoria, they would be most closely related. And if we compare them to cichlids from Lake Kivu, the snail eater and the fish eater from Lake Kivu would go together. However, in some regions of the genome, maybe the snail eaters are more similar genetically, even though they are from different lakes, and the fish eaters are more similar genetically. And at some other region, the snail eater from Lake Victoria may be more similar to the fish eater from Lake Kivu. And the fish eater from Lake Victoria more similar to the snail eater from Lake Kivu. And again, we would expect that these two patterns may just arise because of incomplete lineage sorting, but they should be more or less equally common. And for testing that, I used an F4 test, which compares these two patterns. How often do the snail eaters go together? And how often does the snail eater from Victoria go together with the fish eater from Lake Kivu? And I find a positive F4 test, which indicates that there's more regions where the snail eaters go together and where, where the fish eaters go together. So there's some excess allele sharing of cichlids that have the same ecology even though they're from different lakes. And I did that with lots of different pairs of ecological groups. And in most of them, I found a slightly positive F4 test indicating that cichlids that share the same ecology from different lakes are genetically a bit more similar. So that suggests that there is some alleles that made up a snail eater in Lake Kivu, which were the, and then these alleles got into Lake Victoria and were sorted into a new snail eater in Lake Victoria. So we can answer now a question if the genetic variation contributed to the formation of different groups in Lake Victoria. It seems that yes, some alleles that are already that already contributed to the formation of the ecological groups in the older lakes were sorted into similar ecological groups in Lake Victoria. However, Lake Victoria does not just have the same ecological groups like in the other lakes. It also contains ecological groups that are not found in the older lakes. One example are these pelagic dwarf predators. And when you look at them, they seem to look a bit like pelagic zooplanktivores in body shape, but they feed on, 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 on little fry um, and, and jaw-like they look more like the large predators. And genetically, that's exactly what they look like as well. So this is now a genetic similarity matrix um, where I'm comparing each cichlid with each other cichlid. And if it's red or, or, or um, dark, then they are genetically more similar. And you can see here a triangle of dwarf predators together with the large predators indicating that they are genetically very similar. But these little dwarf predators, they also have a dark region here, which is 
um, which indicates genetic sharing with the pelagic zooplanktivores. So it seems that the pelagic zooplanktivores and the large predators hybridized and gave rise to this new ecological group of pelagic dwarf predators. And um, I have not just looked at this genetic similarity matrix, but also performed lots of other tests and they all support this scenario of hybrid origin. So it seems that at least some of these new ecological groups seem to represent new combinations of the alleles that um, came in from the other uh, lake radiations. So we have now a third layer of hybridization where within the lake radiation, we had hybridization events that gave rise to new ecological groups. So we have this multi-layered um, mixing of genetic variation and then sorting into different species. And then again, mixing and sorting and mixing and sorting. And this seems to have happened over and over and over again. And I think that's really what allowed these cichlids to diversify so rapidly within just 15,000 years, 500 species. That's absolutely amazing. You can uh, imagine this as um, with, with Lego objects, which are a bit more easy to think of maybe. Um, it's kind of like if you combine um, two different Lego objects and then mix up the Lego bricks and then sort them into lots of new objects. This is extremely fast because you start with a large genetic variation or lots of different Lego bricks in this case. And it's much faster than the slow accumulation by mutations, which would be like changing small pieces at a time and then um, much, much more slowly you would get from one object to another. Um, and this takes much more time. And so it is possible that because the lake is so, so young, these other lineages, which did not hybridize, which did not have such high genetic creation to start with, they just didn't have enough time to speciate, to diversify so massively. Whereas this lineage, which started with hybrid origin, had a head start because genetic variation was much higher to start with. Um, but then the next question arises, why didn't these ones hybridize? Well, and the answer is they don't have close relatives with which they could hybridize in the region. However, this little guy here, which is Pseudocranilabrus, it has not speciated in five lakes in the Lake Victoria region. But then, it also colonized Lake Bangweulu. Uh, the Sambisi lineage from, of Pseudocranilabrus colonized Lake Bangweulu. And again, it did not speciate. But, um, and the Congolese lineage colonized Lake Mueru, which is part of the Congo drainage system. And then you can see that there's no connection, but then about a million years ago, a collect connection arose here because of um, the change of the river flow. And about a million years ago, the Sambisi lineage from Lake Bangweulu could get into Lake Mueru, where it encountered the Congolese lineage. The two hybridized and they speciated into 15 species. So it's not that Pseudocranilabrus are per se unable to speciate. It's just that it requires ecological opportunity and high genetic variation to speciate very, very rapidly. And for in Lake Bangulu, they may just not yet have had the time to speciate. But here where two lineages came together and combined their genetic variation, they could speciate very rapidly. Um, and so recently I have switched to Heliconius butterflies and wanted to figure out if what I'm finding with the cichlids is just something cichlid specific, or if it's really a general mechanism. Uh, Heliconius butterflies are very interesting because they uh, form different mimicry rings. So you can see here one species, Heliconius serrato, with lots of different color variations, and another species, Heliconius mepomene, which shows very, very similar color variations. And this is because wherever these species coexist, they look very similar because they're toxic and the birds learn to avoid them through their warning coloration. And if one species 
um, and if birds have already encountered one species and learned that that one is toxic, another one that looks very similar um, will benefit from looking the same because the birds will remember and will not eat a butterfly that looks like the disgusting one they have already tested. But then if it looks different, they may think, oh, maybe this one's tasty. And I was studying um, together with Chris Jiggins and Patricia Salazar, who, who actually collected these butterflies. I collected, helicon uh, we studied Heliconius serratum at Omen in Ecuador. And here there's a region of contact between highland and lowland forms of Heliconius serrato and Heliconius mepomen. And again, you can see in the highland, they look the same and in the lowland, they look the same. But interestingly, in the center at mid elevation, there is a form that combines the red pattern of the lowland race and has also two four wing patches like the highland race. So I wanted to study if maybe combining the genetic variation of having two um, four wing spots and the red from the lowland generated this new hybrid form in the center in both species. So I looked at um, genetic divergence between highland and lowland forms in Narata and in Mepomene. And I found that the same four regions, the same four genes are um, strongly genetically divergent between highland and lowland forms. And when I looked at, when I performed GWAS to figure out um, what those genes do, for instance, here I was comparing butterflies that have two versus one um, four wing patch. I found a very strong correlation um, that, that these, that butterflies that have two versus one differ at this um, gene, which I also found to be highly divergent between highland and lowland butterflies. And this, this peak here um, seems to stem from having red in the forewing or having red um, as this pattern. And so basically I could look at these four genes and I knew what these four genes do. Um, and at these four genes, the highland and the lowland um, butterflies have different gene variants. And then I could look at the butterflies at mid elevation. And I found that indeed, they combine um, the highland gene variants at some genes and the lowland gene variants at some other genes, which generates this new hybrid form, which is very common in the center of this hybrid region. So basically also in the butterflies, it's just like reshuffling Lego bricks again. And I'm not the only one who found things like that. Um, actually recently, thanks to new genomic opportunities that we have now to study hybridization. More and more studies have accumulated that show that um, often when speciation is very rapid or when entire adaptive radiations occur, um, genetic variation is often derived from hybridization. Often it is all the alleles that get reshuffled and resorted into new species. And you can see also here Darwin's finch, also in Darwin's finch is the example I showed at the beginning. The genes that contribute to the beak shape and size are old genetic variants that have been repeatedly sorted into different species on the Galapagos Islands. And so we, we think that in cases of rapid speciation and adaptive radiation, this combinatorial mechanism of sorting of old alleles may be much more important than we previously thought. Now, since um, a few days, I have started a Branko Weiss Fellowship as well, which um, allows me to study a new group of butterflies, the erythomine butterflies. And I'm studying here factors that contributed to two of these genera speciating extremely rapidly. And I'm interested to know if I find again that hybridization played an important role. And with that, I would like to thank all the collaborators of the cichlid work and the main collaborators of the butterfly work. And many thanks again, Imander and, Dr. and Professor Singh for inviting me. 
I'm very happy to have questions now. Hello, Johnny. Uh, I'm Dr. Munakshi. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for such a nice talk. And now I'll be taking up questions from the students. Many thanks. My first question is from Linda. Uh, she, uh, she, her question is, uh, what are the interactions of sexually and naturally selected traits in the adaptive radiation of cichlid fishes? The interactions. Um, ah, okay, maybe one example. Um, I was showing that that um, I was showing that in deeper water, red is the main color that penetrates the water. And what we find is that often uh, cichlids that live in the deeper water, they are um, red, and cichlids that live in the more shallow water are blue. And that's a very important for um, ecologic, for natural selection, because red-backed cichlids in the shallow water will immediately be eaten by birds. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture in this presentation, but Lake Victoria is like the, the shore is full of birds that like to feed fish, feed on fish. So if there's a red-backed cichlid in the shallow water, it will immediately be eaten. And in the herbid water, they can be red and it's actually very beneficial because the cichlids see red very well. And therefore red is a very, a, a color that, that is probably more appealing to the females. And therefore, there is sexual selection for being as red as possible in the more terp, more um, deep water cichlids. Like for instance, there's a species pair that has been studied a lot, which I also studied, which is Punamilia cichlids, where um, the shallow water one is blue and the deep water one is red. Females of the deep water Punamilia um, prefer red and females of the shallow water Punamilia prefer blue. And so we have sexual selection on coloration, but also ecological selection on the same trait on coloration. Okay, my next question is from Gurpreet. Uh, her question is, what could be the reason that some groups diversify faster than others? Yeah, that, that's basically my main question. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, what I found for the cichlids is that those lineages that are of hybrid origin, they diversified faster. So what I didn't show now is that we have also been looking at those lineages that colonized all those lakes in the Lake Victoria region and they did not speciate. And they have lower genetic variation and no signs of hybrid origin. And also in, in these um, the Lake Bangwulu and Lake Mueru cichlids, I again find the same where in, in Lake Bangwulu, where there's no hybridization, there is no new species. Whereas in Lake Mueru, where there is hybridization, new species evolved. And here I've only shown uh, pseudocranilabrus, but actually there's multiple lineages in Lake Mueru that hybridized and formed adaptive radiations. And all of those lineages in Lake Bangwulu did not hybridize because the Congolese lineages cannot go into Lake Bangwulu because there's rapids and waterfalls. So the Zambesian lineages can go into Lake Mueru, but the Congolese lineages cannot go into Lake Bangwulu. So there's no hybridization here, and I find no adaptive radiations. There's lots of hybridization here, and I find multiple adaptive radiations. So in the cichlids, I find over and over again that hybridization seems to make a difference in if species, if lineages form adaptive radiations very rapidly or not. But of course, um, it requires ecological opportunity. Um, and if you don't have ecological opportunity and if the lineage colonizes a lake that where almost all niches are already filled, for instance, then even if it is of hybrid origin, I would expect that it would not diversify. And that's basically also what I find in the rivers here where there's way less ecological opportunity. Some of the river and taxa, they are of hybrid origin, but they don't speciate at all. And that's probably just because of lack of ecological opportunity. 
Okay, my next question is, uh, since the cichlid radiation is quite young and there are secondary contacts, so what is your view that some of the genes which led to divergent selection could not be overcome by the homogenizing effect on the genome? Um, wait, so the question is, why, why they managed to diverge despite being so young? No, no. Uh, the question is that, that uh, there, there are, are few genes which, which have led to the divergent selection or differentiation. And uh, since, since the radiation, radiation is quite young, young and uh, uh, the, the genes, genes might not, not have differentiated to such an extent, extent. And, and when these species they come to secondary contact, contact this, this kind, kind of, of differentiation might have overcome um, by, by the genes. It was very difficult to understand you acoustically. There's there's like a very strong echo. Um, can you maybe just read the question again, please? Okay, now it's okay. okay. But uh, yeah, I, he meant right. I almost don't understand you. No. no. Maybe a bit better. Should I read? Yeah, maybe. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you better, yeah. Can you please just read the question again? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, since the cichlid radiation is quite young and there are secondary contacts, so what is your view that some of the genes which led to divergent selection could not be overcome by the homogenizing effect on the genome? Um, I'm, okay, I, I would just explain what I think the question means. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, so I, I assume this question comes from thinking of like a hybrid zone. Um, and, and then if, if the cichlids are so young, how, how do they manage to overcome the genetic, the genetic mixing that, that we would expect given that they are so young? Um, and in, in this case here, so these hybridization events that, that I've shown here, for instance, they are, um, they, they probably led to, to complete mixing. So initially, they did not overcome the homogenizing effect of gene flow. They, they, probably it was complete mixing. Also, for instance, in Lake Victoria, we could imagine that those lineages colonized the lake when the water was very turbid. And therefore, you would expect that um, the cichlids may not mate as assortatively as they usually do, because if the water is very turbid, they cannot see color very well. And as I said, color is very important for them to distinguish if a male is from the same species or not. And so they, if the water is very turbid, they mate much more randomly. This is also what Ole Seehausen's group has tested with um, giving cichlids light conditions where they cannot see color, then they just mate randomly. And when you give them light conditions where they can see color, they have very, very strong preference for males of their own species. And so I could imagine that when those lineages came together at the beginning when Lake Victoria formed, that the lake was still very turbid because it was still very shallow and therefore the lineage is probably completely hybridized. So there was no, um, there was, there was no selection against um, homogenization of gene flow. But then later when the lake um, filled up more and more and more ecological opportunity arose, arose um, we imagine that there was this very genetically extremely diverse group of cichlids that was kind of a mix um, and then some of them may have been better at feeding on algae and others may have been better at feeding on, on snails, for instance. And like that, they may have diverged um, by adapting to these different ecological resources. And because there is also different coloration, if the, if the, the ecological adaptations then get linked to preference for different coloration, 
um, new species can arise much more easily because they then mate assortatively and don't um, mix with the others anymore. But they are, there's very little intrinsic incompatibilities. So you can basically cross all Lake Victoria cichlids. Um, it's mostly assortative mating, which keeps them apart. So last question. I answered it, yeah. Uh, mostly during colonization, the demographic or the effective population size decreases, uh, assuming that the genetic diversity will also decrease. So have you observed this in case of cichlid fishes? So that if the genetic diversity decreases when? Yes, the effective population size also decreases. When they colonize a new lake. No, that is, uh, you, Johanna, are you able to hear me now? Yes, now it's much better. Okay. So the question is like, uh, in case of invasive species, when they colonize a new habitat or a new region, then mm -hmm. uh, we say then there is a paradox that uh, they pass through bottleneck. Yes. And, uh, yes. And when they pass through bottleneck, we feel that there is a decrease in demographic situation or sort of uh, effective yeah. population size. And then yes. there is a decrease in genetic diversity. Mm. Yeah, what exactly. we assume. But now, now it is coming otherwise that uh, they have found that uh, there is no effect on the genetic diversity through bottleneck as well. So is there any kind of situation or a, a, a problem which might these fishes have faced during this colonization event that their population size might have decreased? Um, well, the, the bottleneck, if there was a bottleneck, then it's not visible anymore because they then hybridized. And so the genetic diversity increased and therefore the effective population size also increased massively again. But actually in invasive species, we, we see something similar sometimes. Many of the invasive species um, recently have been found to be of hybrid origin. And that's probably exactly for that reason. Like if there's only a few individuals to start a new um, lineage, then there's strong bottlenecks and local adaptation is difficult, etc. But then if they hybridize with closely related um, locally adapted populations or with with other introductions from other regions and their genetic variation gets enriched through hybridization and they can become more invasive. So I don't know if that's happened in the Lake Victoria cichlids, but I could imagine it because we see it in other lineages. But for this hybridization to occur, what I feel is that the lineages which hybridize at a point of time, like in case of these cichlid fishes, they might not have diverged allopatrically to such an extent that uh, hybridization has contributed to genetic richness. Yeah, so they, those lineages that hybridized here in Lake Victoria or at the that like the Congolese and the Upper Nile lineage that colonized, that hybridized initially, um, they are divergent enough that they have very different genetic variation, but still not too divergent so that they are still able to hybridize. And there's probably this specific time window where hybridization, where like divergence time window, right? Where if hybridization happens, it, it it can generate new genetic variation that can lead to adaptive radiation. If they had been too distantly related, probably all the hybrids would just have suffered a lot from intrinsic incompatibilities. And if they had been too closely related, the effect of genetic enrichment would not have been as strong. Um, yeah, so I think there's probably this sweet spot of genetic divergence that, that's ideal for this kind of scenario. Yes, because uh, uh, it has also been observed that genetic variation, which is the understanding genetic variation, and as well as uh, the adaptive variation, they are two different things because adaptive variation and genetic variation, um, normally they do not correspond with one another because adaptive variation could be different and genetic variation, standing genetic variation, could be different. Yeah, exactly. Like in, yeah, like in case of invasive species. Mm -hmm. 
so that's all yohana that was a wonderful talk and a lot of good discussion and thanks for sparing your time and thanks a lot it was really a nice overview on speciation and hybridization which is the need of the art thank you many thanks many thanks